This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Okay, hello. Um, and so today for 224N, I'm going to start into the topic of looking at semantics, that is, the issue of meaning or how to understand text. So I think it's fair to say that, in general, um, when people think of natural language processing and what it can do for them, really what they want is, okay, text is going to come in and we're going to understand it. Meanings are going to come out and at the end of it, it all. And so it's good that I'm eventually getting to the part of the course to talk about that and say something about this. Um, there's some kind of technical class organizational reasons for why I don't say so much about natural language understanding in this class, which is partly that every second year um, Dan Jurafsky and me have been co-teaching a separate class on natural language understanding. But it's also partly a reflection of the fact that if you actually look at um, what's been happening in the world over the last decade, that a lot of the work that's actually been being used and being successful hasn't really been trying to do high level natural language understanding, that a lot of the time it's actually been focused much more down doing the kind of lower level analysis tasks that we've spent a lot of the time on. And it's also clearly the case that those tasks are sort of useful prerequisites for being able to do deeper natural language understanding. But nevertheless, thinking globally, it, you know, I mean, what everyone wants is watch their science fiction movies, is to be able to have their pet robot that will talk to them, and that seems to involve being able to do natural language understanding. And a lot of the other applications you can think of for natural language, of doing summarization, translation, question answering, um, spoken user interfaces, all of these you actually have to understand what's being said and what's being able to talk, to being talked about to be able to act intelligently. And it still seems to be the case that if you're thinking ahead to, well, what can be done in the next decade as the new kind of intelligent applications that can be delivered, it seems like it's crucial to be able to deliver more intelligent applications than we have at the moment, that they actually have to understand more of the material that's available. So something like web search, it works pretty well a lot of the time, but if you think about, well, how could I offer a qualitatively better experience of what's going on, it seems like at some point you actually have to have a system that can understand more of what's on those web pages so it can do more intelligent things and be able to take actions. On the other hand, I mean, that's kind of been a kind of a viewpoint that sort of time has sort of never quite come. I mean, if you look back on the history of AI, it seemed completely too obvious to people in the 1970s that if you were going to do anything useful with natural language understanding and processing, well, then you had to have understanding and deep semantic representations and be able to process those to do natural language understanding. Um, so I really think that, you know, the, the most dramatic thing and summary of the last decade is effectively that people have shown that you can just get amazingly far in producing useful artifacts by understanding almost nothing. Um, that that's really been the breakthrough in the deployment of natural language technologies in recent years. Um, but nevertheless, um, I don't think that that buys you everything. So kind of um, low-level processing techniques are appropriate when you want to deal with speed and volume, and you can get away with doing a limited, a very, very limited amount of semantic understanding to be able to address some task. And you know, there are lots of good tasks out there. I mean, lots of things that people would like to have done for them, of having their spelling corrected, finding things in the web, extracting who works at what company. You know, there are a lot um, processing people's resumes. You know that there are tons of good tasks out there that people are now working on and can do a very good job with very little understanding. But there are also then just lots of tasks in which you just have to understand much more to be able to uh, attack them sensibly. And I think actually one of the key distinctions will effectively be when you want to be able to have computers form tasks where, perform tasks where they 
have independent responsibility for doing low-level actions which might build up to a higher-level action. So for something like web search, the computer finds candidate documents, but the human is right there to look at the documents and decide which, which documents are good ones and which ones are bad ones, and they read the documents and get whatever information there is to be gotten out of them. Whereas if you have your computer that's responsible for a higher level task, like the computer is responsible for going out and investigating what kind of espresso machine that you should buy and then placing the order for the best price, um, well then the computer really has to understand a lot more about what's being said on pages to understand what's a good espresso machine to buy. Um, okay. Um, but what I thought I'd just sort of do for a few minutes then is go back in time and tell you how the world used to be. Because um, there's a sort of a funny way in which in recent times there's been all this exciting work in doing machine learning and building systems up from large corpora and lots of probabilities and abilities to do interesting things um, at a large scale and at work very well over large amounts of data. But, you know, at the same time as that work, I mean, that's kind of led to a, a sort of everybody forgetting how the world used to be and how in the old days people did used to build systems which were much more hand-built systems that actually could in various ways do interesting, semantically precise um, processing. So, um, so Fernando Pereira is a... Um, these days, um, a well-known machine learning probability NLP um, researcher, so he was one of the people centrally involved in conditional random fields that I briefly mentioned um, when doing MEMMs, and he's actually working at Google right at the moment. Um, but way back when, um, in 1980, um, Fernando Pereira was working on his PhD dissertation, and what he worked on then was this prolog system, which he called CHAT80, because it was written in 1980. Um, its goal was to do full natural language understanding in a restricted domain so it can do question answerings. And this is, was sort of, there have been several kind of famous systems of that era um, that have been kind of key kind of natural language understanding systems that were developed. Um, but it was one of the very well-known ones, which actually um, had a surprising longevity of usage. I mean, the most recent use I know of is I was sitting in a conference in 2000, 20 years after um, this was written, and these people were presenting a paper about a system um, where you could ask questions about train routes and schedules. And it turned out that what they were actually using on the back end to do their processing was still a version of Chat80, and that they'd sort of put, done development of different lexicon and grammar um, for that system. Okay, so I'll just show you Chat80 um, for a few minutes. So this is something where after just real soon now, I'm going to have to do some remedial um, work because it turns out the version of Prolog I have for this um, only runs on Spark machines. And we've just about reached the point um, where um, Stanford has um, gotten rid of their very last Spark machine. So I guess for next year, um, I'll have to get hold of a um, version that works on Linux. But fortunately for me, I've still got until... Um, June 16th to be able to give this demo on a Spark machine, so I'll do that. Um, I, no? Oh, wait, I have, to, I have to load it. Okay, so this has a database of, what it has a database is a database of geography. And so the idea is that you can ask various kinds of um, questions about um, geography um, and it will give the answers. Um, so this is kind of America. Which countries border Iraq? Okay. I'm told about how bad geography knowledge is in the United States. Which countries border Iraq? Syria, Kuwait, Syria, Kuwait. 
Iran, Turkey. Was that a vote for Jordan? Any more? We're up to five. Iran, Jordan, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia. You miss Saudi Arabia. Okay. Um, and um, then you can ask more questions, difficult questions. So you can say, which countries that border Turkey, border Iraq? Okay, what's the answer to this one? Syria, yeah. Any others? Iran, is that? Yeah, Iran and Syria. Okay, and so there are um, lots of other kinds of questions that you can ask it. I mean, you can ask it kind of sort of, um, what is the total population of countries south of the equator? Um, 409 million. It's probably grown a bit since 1980. Um, so one of the things that you'll note for this is um, it's not very up to date on modern world stuff. This is still in the era when the Soviet Union existed. All right, so I can ask which countries border the Soviet. And it also has a little cheat that for multi-word things, it doesn't identify its own multi-word things. And you have to use an underscore. Um, you can ask all the obvious stuff. What is the capital of Finland? Um, it knows about that. Um, you can kind of make them more complex. So, you know, I could take my earlier example. Total population of countries south of the equator and not in South America. Wait, no, I didn't like that one. Um, what is the largest country in South America? Yeah, I can ask that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not quite, I'm not quite sure why the one I just asked got an I don't understand. I mean, but that's absolutely a property of the system that I will not deny for a moment. That this system has got a fixed grammar and a fixed lexicon, and providing you stay within the boundaries of that, you can ask quite complex things, and it really does. Um, manage to work them out okay, um, but you know, if you do anything that goes with outside the bounds of that grammar by some means, well then it's just no dice and you get, I don't understand, and that's the end of the story. So you can ask it um, to give more information about how it does all of this. So you can ask for a trace, but maybe before I do that, I'll just sort of show you a teeny bit of um, what's there. So effectively, what does, what does this system run on? Um, so that there's a, a little databases where the little databases are data log, for those of you who've done your 145 style class. Um, so here's facts about countries. So you have this, uh, these predicates about countries where you have the country, um, the regions in latitude, longitude, that's why you can ask about things like south of the equator, um, area, population, capital, currency. So these are facts about countries. And then there are some other databases that tell you facts about other things. And there's a top level one of world 0.pl where various relations are defined and various other things. And in particular, what you can see here is some of the kind of accessor predicates. So these accessor predicates are kind of like having views on the database. So if you want to know whether something is a country, you're basically seeing whether it fills the first slot of the country relation or not. Um, and you can use ad adjectives like African, and that's then being 
um, realized as an incontinent relation, and you can work that out from those relations. Um, so that there's um, kind of relationships are worked out like that. And then top level, there's then lexicons and grammars. I forget what the file's called. Okay, so that the actual... Okay, so here's essentially um, where it's working out a lexicon of different words and um, this then, um, I don't know if there's a best, a best, a best bit to show, um, is then, um, you know, so a sentence can be a declarative sentence with a period, a WH question, imperatives, um, you then have how to expand out a WH question. Um, then down here we had structures of noun phrases. So it's got a very explicit grammar like that. Um, okay, so once I have trace on, if I then ask it a question like which countries border Mexico? I mean, what we get is that what the system does is it builds up a parse tree. So this is showing a parse tree um, as an indented list representation. So it's a WH question which has the kind of the WH variable out the front here, which is the thing that we're going to want to find, um, is the which. And then there's a sentence with a noun phrase. So it's plural, which countries, and here's the country. And then it's the verb border. And then you have the argument NP, that's the object Mexico. Um, so it builds up a form of syntactic parse tree like that. And then what it does um, is converts that into a semantic representation um, answer. It's an answer if it's a country and borders Mexico. And then it actually has a little query planner in there, like a database system, which um, decides what's an efficient way to answer this query. And so it works out how to, to plan the best query result. And then eventually, here we get our answer back again. OK, maybe I should just show one other type of question. Um, you can actually ask list questions in it as well. So you can just ask something like, what are the capitals of the countries bordering the Baltic, and it'll do all its stuff, and then we can actually get back a list here. So Denmark's capital, Copenhagen, East Germany's capital, East Berlin, etc. Um, I guess there are also yes/no questions. Does Afghanistan border China? A yes or a no? No. That's wrong. It's a yes. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of China that sticks off. Um, okay, so um, that's the chain 80 system. And so, I mean, I don't. I'll do one more. Which is a long one that I know works for my, my cheat sheet, providing I can spell it correctly. Which country bordering the Mediterranean borders a country that is bordered by a country whose population exceeds the population of India? Wait, I didn't get it right. Damn, Mitch will be able to answer that question. Maybe I'll just leave it now and go on. Um, okay. Um, but anyway, in, providing you stay inside the grammar, quite complex questions, that kind of structure, um, it can give answers too. Okay, so, um, so this is just, again, showing um, the kind of predicates there and then how you can kind of have one of these 
effectively kind of views on the database where you can get facts out about things. Okay, hopefully that seems familiar. Well, so that's the kind of easiest case where we have constants and so we can evaluate at compile time and just work out the meaning of that as 33 and put in 33 into our system. I mean, the more typical cases that we write an arithmetic expression is something like this, 3 plus, three t plus 5 times x. And then what we want to do is say, well, we're still going to have semantic attachments of our syntax rules, and those semantic attachments are going to tell us how to work how to work out the value of the whole thing. And so now the meaning at a node can't be kind of a fully evaluated answer. It instead has to be, okay, here's a little piece of code that will tell us how to calculate the answer. And so now what we're going to have is, okay, the meaning, the meaning given by a semantic attachment here is going to be, you're going to multiply by five whatever the value of this is that's determined when the program is run, and then you're going to add three to that. So we can still work out a meaning as a semantic attachment going up, but it's underspecified because we don't know the values of things. Okay, and so we refer to that. This, so the general idea of what you're doing here in natural language processing, this is referred to as rule-to-rule -rule translation. And so the idea is, we have syntax rules, so here's our syntax rule. An expression can consist of an expression, a function, and another expression. Um, then we have a semantic attachment attached to this syntax rule saying, suppose you know the meaning of these three things, I'll tell you how to, how to calculate the meaning of this bigger thing. Right, that that's the semantic attachment. And that's referred to as rule-to-rule -rule translation because it's knowing these rules meanings, we then give a rule to a method of calculating this rule's meaning, and you work compositionally up the tree. Okay, um, and so essentially the picture that we're going to build is, okay, let's work out how to do um, that same thing for um, natural language sentences. And in some sense, we'll refer to that as understanding the sentence. I mean, this concept of what counts as understanding is actually um, a very tricky philosophical issue, um, and I'm not going to spend more than one slide on it, but I'll just mention it. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm saying this means that we understand this arithmetic expression, and we've calculated a We've given us semantics for it as to what these arithmetic expressions mean. And there's a sort of sense in which that seems to be true. Um, but in another sense, you could say, well, no, you've taken one bunch of symbols and you've converted them into another bunch of symbols. Um, why is that understanding anything? Um, and so that's this question of then what counts as understanding. So, I mean, there are various ways that you can think of what understanding means. So, I mean, one way of thinking of semantics is operational semantics. So that if you can carry out actions, that means that you understand things. So if the person can type throw x at dwarf and that happens, well, that means that you've understood it. Um, in logical philosophical work, a very common idea is this notion of truth conditional semantics. So that if you can determine a truth of the truth of a statement relative to a world, um, that means that you've understood it. Um, okay. Um, similarly, you know, if you can answer questions, that means that you've understood it. I mean, for many years, um, people have suggested natural language processing that, you know, ability to translate is proof of understanding. So that if you can take something and translate it into Chinese, um, that means that you've understood it. But, you know, if you start thinking about some of these notions, that they're um, very, very slippery, right? Because, well, we worked on machine translation, and okay, the machine translation systems um, that you guys built weren't very good, but hopefully your Model 2 output out of the decoder was sort of getting to be almost intelligible sometimes. And, well, you know, they're bigger people's um, statistical MT systems, and sometimes they can translate sentences perfectly um, into different languages, but, you know, 
Um, if you're thinking about what you built for programming assignment two, um, you probably don't feel in your heart of hearts that your system understood the language. It was just doing these probability tables and sometimes something okay came out at the end of it. Um, so, you know, it's very unclear what then counts as translation. But nevertheless, the goal that we're going to work with at the moment is this sort of traditional goal of understanding means translating into formal logic. So essentially a first order propositional calculus version, pre sorry, predicate calculus version. And the picture that I'm going to then show next Wednesday is that that, at least in certain circumstances, will let us do um, this um, higher level thing of being able to perform tasks. Because we can then fairly readily convert those representations into something where we can query a database um, or put stuff into a database and so that we have a kind of an operational task semantics. Okay, yeah, so today I'm going to sort of say some of the general ideas of compositional semantics as an introduction and then I'm going to briefly mention at the end semantic grammars that are an alternative that have sometimes been used. Next Wednesday, I'm going to talk in detail about um, how you can build compositional semantic representations. And then for the final week of the, and then I sort of don't say anything about knowledge representation reasoning. And then for the final um, week of the class, on Monday, I'm going to talk about lexical semantics, is, which is um, how do you actually work out what words mean? Because, you know, as well as being able to combine meanings, you have to know what words mean. And then... Um, on the final class, I'll talk a bit about some of the high-level semantic applications that people have been working on of doing question answering, semantic search, textual entailment, and problems like that. Okay, so here's, I mean, I know there's this problem that people who do computer science and similar subjects often end up feeling like they um, sit through five different introductions to logic. So I'm not really going to do much of introduction to logic and assume um, that um, you've seen logic before. But basically, um, what I want to say, sort of work towards, is how can you construct logical representations, which in general in logic courses, um, no one ever says anything about. So often in logic classes, in the first two weeks, there are exercises where you're meant to take sentences of English and convert them into logic. And the way you do that is you use your brain in mysterious ways and write down what's the correct logical interpretation. And then for the rest of the semester, you work with um, predicate calculus, P implies Q of X or Y, Z or something. And no one talks about um, human languages ever again, um, which is in some sense wrong, since, you know, historically, why, why formal logic was invented was it was meant to help people understand human reasoning in human languages. That was actually the motivation, but it sort of tended to be lost in the logical tradition when people have worked with formal representations. And in particular, most of the time, people just don't actually work out how can you do any kind of automatic translation from human language sentences to logical sentences. And so that's what we're going to look at. Okay, but nevertheless, so what are we going to have underlying here? So what we're going to be have underlying here is we're going to have Booleans, you know about those. We have individuals, um, so they're things like people, might be other things like times. And then we can have um, functions of various kinds uh, or predicates. Um, so frog x, green x. And in particular, we are going to call those predicates ones which have a Boolean return value. So is it green is a predicate. OK, and so predicates define sets who are the individuals that satisfy the predicate. Um, and if the predicate has only one argument, as a lot of the ones we look at are, I'm going to call them um, properties. And essentially, um, we can make more complex functions out of simple functions. And in particular, with the kind of techniques that people use to represent um, natural language meanings and the construction of natural language meanings tend to make quite a lot of use of higher order functions. So higher order functions are then functions that take functions as arguments and maybe return functions as their values. And so to be able to do that, um, we use lambda calculus. Um, how many of you guys have seen lambda calculus in another class like programming languages? Some, but not all. Okay. Um, 
so very briefly. Um, so when we write you know, functions or methods in Java, right, that we give them names. And so we have a name, and it takes some arguments, and then it maybe returns a value. Okay, and so we have a function name. Right? But in some sense, the key thing is the behavior of the function. And we should be able to have functions that can do something without giving them, na giving them names. And so the idea of lambda calculus is it's a notation for being able to produce and process functions that don't have to have names. And the advantage of having functions that don't have to have names is that you can just invent them on the fly as you need them. Right, so you could write down a function that's a squaring function, and you say it's sort of square of x, and its value is that it returns x times x. But you should also just be able to write a function that doesn't have a name. So here's the lambda function for a squaring function. So you're writing a lambda before each argument of the function, and then you commonly write a dot or a square bracket or something like that, and then you're saying the value of the function after that which is what will be returned. So this takes one argument, it calculates p times p, and that's the value that gets returned. And so what we're going to be often doing for our natural language understanding is constructing these kind of lambda functions. And so once we have a function like lambda p, p times p, we can then take this function and do function applications, so we can give it an argument three. And the way that we then evaluate this function is we substitute three for the argument p, and then we evaluate this three times three, and we return that as the return value of the function. Okay. Um, that makes sense? Do I just hit space bar? Go on. OK. Um, a crucial thing to note is, in reality, lambda functions only take one argument at a time. There isn't any inherent notion of functions that take multiple arguments in lambda calculus. Um, what you do instead is you fake functions that take multiple arguments. And the way you fake functions that take multiple arguments is you make use of this notion of higher level functions. So suppose I want to have a function that multiplies um, two numbers. Well, the way I can have a function that multiplies two numbers is I can write a function that um, takes a number. And what it's going to do is return as its value a function. And this function is going to be a function that takes a number and then returns times x, y, does the multiplication. And so if I take that function and then give it two arguments times 5, 6, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is I'm going to take this function and apply it to the value 5. And so it's going to return as its value lambda, lambda y times xy, where x has become 5. So there'll be lambda y times 5y, and then I'm going to apply that function to the value 6. So y will become 6, and I'll return times 5, 6. Okay, so I can make use of the order idea of higher order functions to simulate um, multiple argument functions. Okay, and that process is referred to as currying after a logician whose name was Curry, um, maybe not surprisingly. OK. Um, so, so for our individuals, um, we have kind of some of them we're going to give names as constants, right? So that we can have a constant that's a person, which is George Bush. We can have a constant that is, is a named predicate, so whether something is red, that can be a constant. And then we can have constants that are kind of predicates with multiple arguments. So we can have love predicate, where it's a known, it's a known predicate of two arguments. And we have facts in the world about whether people love each other. So essentially, we're going to assume that for things that we know about, we have little database tables where we can look up who loves each other. 
Okay. Um, and then we can go on from there, and we can also then make representations of more interesting kinds of functions. So here's the kind of interesting function that we can build. So we might want to build a most function. So, well, what we'd like to be able to say is something like, um, whatever, most elephants are big. Um, so that means we've got, when we say most, we have two, we've got two predicates that we can, are involved in a most representation. So we have the elephant predicate, um, which is what we're talking about, and we have the big predicate. So I mean, both of those are properties. They're things that uh, delimit a set of individuals. They're the set of things that are elephants and the set of things that are big. And so we want to then take those two functions and then make a most function that operates over them. So here again, we're into the space of higher order functions. So our representation of most is going to be that most is, I think it's kind of easiest to see here, that most is going to be something that takes two functions, two properties, and then it's going to itself be returning a Boolean value, which is saying, is it true that most most pigs are big. Okay, so if we want to evaluate that, how do we do it? Well, the way we do that is, well, we're going to have um, this. If we look at this function, it picks out in our world a set of things that are pigs. And this function picks out a set of things that are big. And what we want to know is if you look at the, if you look at the set of pigs and then you ask which ones of those are big, that um, over half of the things that are pigs, I had elephants, sorry, before, whatever, um, pigs, elephants, over half of those things are big. Okay, so we can write, just like in our example of 3 plus 5 times 6, we can write a little way to calculate um, whether things satisfy the most representation. And so the crucial thing to note here is a slightly different way of doing things is, you know, normally... Normally, you don't see this when you do a predicate logic course. What you see are these two um, quantifiers, which I hope you remember well. Oh, here's the for all quantifier, and there's the there exists quantifier. So that you're using this um, syncategoremic um, notation where you're introducing all this special stuff um, to represent the two quantifiers of there exists and for all. When we're doing natural language translation, um, by and large, we don't want to do that. We want to be able to treat everything as a function. So we want to have an all function and an exists function. And the reason why we want to do that is because building functions is something we'll easily be able to do in our translation. And then th stuff like this will be how we evaluate a function to see whether it's true. So the exists pig, pig big function will be evaluated by looking at the set of big things and seeing if there's one thing or more in it that's a pig thing. So it'll be a method of evaluating this function. Um, so it's equivalent to this, but it'll just be seen as a method of evaluation. Um, and as well as the fact that we can generate these things to translate, the other reason we want to do this is because natural languages don't only have their existence for all. You know, there's sort of a sense in which those are fundamental for the purposes of logic. But um, natural languages have all kinds of quantifiers. They have ones like um, most and a few, but you know, they also just have um, an infinite space of quantifiers, at least seven, um, quite a quite a large number for a small country. Um, you know, that you can make quantifiers of all kinds of sorts. Okay, so the next thing you need to know about natural languages is as soon as you have quantifiers, quantifiers in natural languages have scope. So we're at, in the semantic level, it's kind of just like what we saw at syntax level with prepositional phrase attachments. We also have at the semantic level, you get these ambiguities of interpretation. Okay, so here's the funny Groucho Marx example. Um, in this country, a woman gives birth every 15 minutes. Our job is to find that woman and stop her. Um, and so this, um, 
this sentence um, has two possible readings. Okay, which is the funny reading? The first one, right. So there exists a woman and um, she gives birth every 15 minutes. And this is the kind of normal um, reading where for every 15 minute interval there's some woman who gives birth in it. And so it's exactly the same situation of just like our PP attachments that the funny thing is this is just the way natural languages are that you get these scope ambiguities. Um, most of the time they don't cause people trouble but if you're thinking from a formal understanding perspective Basically, whenever you have quantifiers, you get a number of readings which is exponential in the number of quantifiers, and that's just how the world is. And I'll show another example of that later. Okay. But um, what I want to sort of um, talk about for a moment is sort of this method of constructing um, compositional semantic representations. And so today I just want to sort of do a very simple example that gives the general idea um, and makes life look very easy, um, which makes the connection between kind of the programming language semantic interpretation and what we want to do for natural language. And then next week, um, we'll start looking at the cases where things get rather more complex and you actually have to be able to do tricky things with lambda calculus um, to make it work. So, but our basic model of what we're going to do is we get a sentence, we parse it for a, to get a syntax tree, um, we have a lexicon where we can look up a meaning representation for each word, and then what we want to do is walk up our syntax tree and calculate a meaning for each bigger thing. And the way we're going to be able to do that is attached to each syntax rule, there's going to be a semantic attachment saying how you can combine the meanings of the lower level parts to make the meaning of the parent node. And so if we start at the bottom and work up, we'll be able to apply those rules and come up with a meaning for larger level units. And the idea of, that you can do that is referred to as the principle of compositionality. Um, so by and large, basically everyone believes in the principle of compositionality because if it weren't true, natural language understanding would be impossible. That we can construct new different sentences every day and people understand them and how can they understand them? They know what the words mean. They know what it means when you put them together. And if you kind of say more senten complex sentences, like, you know, Sue claims that Bill said that Fred thinks that Joe acknowledges that Amanda claims that blah, blah, blah. You know, we can, we can kind of just compositionally work it out in terms of the pieces. I mean, if, on the other hand, um, compositionality isn't quite true in all places and that there are various places from idioms onward in which there seem to be meanings for units um, which aren't easily expressed in terms of meanings of the parts. Okay, so how can we um, realize this notion of having semantic attachments to syntax rules? Um, so one famous early way of doing this was the representation of definite clause grammars. And so definite clause grammars um, is getting us back to prologue technology and um, what we saw for chat 80. Um, so one of the cool things for, about prologue, if you're a natural language person, is that prologue came built into it um, a sort of a syntactic sugar where you could write context-free grammars and you just write down the context-free grammars and then you could just parse lists of terms in terms of those context-free grammars without actually having to do any extra work for yourself. And so this is how you wrote, wrote down a context-free grammar in prologue, um, which is fully equivalent to what we've seen for context-free grammars. Sentence goes to noun phrase, verb phrase. Noun phrase goes to proper noun. Um, noun phrase goes to determine a noun. Verb phrase, verb noun phrase. And here's how you wrote the lexicon and so the items of the lexicon were written as one element lists. And if you just wrote that into prologue and then you ask the question sentence brackets list of um, John ate a lion or something like that 
it would parse it, and you get a parse tree. But the thing that was slightly cooler than that about what you could do with these definite clause grammars, that the definite clause grammars were actually being translated into terms, so that you had a term like sentence of x and with arguments. So rather than just having a plain CFG where your symbols were atoms, you could actually give your symbols arguments. So here's a slightly um, better CFG. And this is a CFG that actually enforces subject-verb agreement. I'm not sure if this worried anybody, but something that might have worried you when you were um, building your parsers for um, the third assignment was the grammars that we were using didn't actually do anything to enforce agreement, right? So that if you gave them sentences like um, the man eat or lions eats, you know, they just parsed them perfectly well. They weren't attempting to check for agreement in any sense. So you might kind of like a grammar that can check for agreement and see that you've got um, correct subject-verb agreement. And so here's how you could do this um, with a definite clause grammar, that I can change my sentence rule to be adding now an argument. So I can say that the sentence consists of a noun phrase which has some number and a verb phrase that can, has some number. And just by writing the same num there, those two variables will be equated in prologue. And so both the noun phrase and the verb phrase will have to have the same number. OK, and so then for the rules for the noun phrase and the verb phrase, I essentially just inherit number. So I'm saying the number of the noun phrase will be the number of the proper noun or the number of the noun. And if there's a determiner, it should share number as well. And the verb phrase's number will be the verb's number. Doesn't matter what the noun phrase's number is. And so then down in my lexicon, I'm then saying facts about the number of things. So I'm saying that Mary is a singular proper noun. The can be either a singular or a plural determiner. Lion is a singular um, noun. Lions is a plural noun. Eat, eat. OK, so with just this grammar, I can now send it back into my prologue system. And if I say um, the lion eats, it will parse correctly because eats is singular, um, lion is singular. Those will get inherited, and therefore this rule will match. Whereas if I try, it, try and give it the sentence, um, the lions eat, oh, sorry, the lions eats, um, then this will be singular, that will be plural, and so the top level S rule just won't match, and so it will return that that sentence isn't accepted by the grammar. Okay, so that's kind of cool, and so that leads us down into this space of writing feature based grammars, because I can then start thinking of other things where I want to put features into my grammar and have those features checked as I parsed. But one particular kind of feature that you can put into your grammar is you can actually then say, well, why don't I make use of the fact that I can put variables into my grammar? And why don't I put variables in that actually have the meaning of the sentence? So this is the idea of these semantic attachments. So here I now say um, I've got the sentence's meaning, and I'm going to do rule-to-rule -rule translation. And how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to have the noun phrase have some meaning, and the verb phrase has some meaning. And then the one other thing I could do with the DCG is put something after it in these um, curly braces. And that meant this is the semantic attachment for this rule. So the semantic attachment of this rule said combine the noun phrase meaning and the verb phrase meaning to give the sentences meaning. And the way I do this combination is simply I do function application. So I'm going to take the meaning of the verb phrase as a function, apply the meaning of the noun phrase to it as an argument, and I'm going to return the result as the sentence's meaning. So prologue was all written relationally. There weren't actually any functions in prologue. Everything was a relation. But the apply predicate is saying um, take this function, apply this argument to it, and that's its return value, and that's what I'm returning. 
okay. So my grammar is just using function application everywhere to combine meanings here. And then my lexicon now has meanings for terms. And my lexicon is being written um, using lambda calculus. So John and Mary here are just constants, John and Mary. But for jumps, I've got my lambda expression. So it's a function, lambda x jumps x. And for loves, I've then got this higher order function that takes an argument and returns another function, which takes an argument, which returns loves as its value. So if I've got this now, well now I can actually work out the meaning of a sentence. So that if you look at the kind of the meaning that's constructed from the sentence in my DCG, and I want to have a meaning for John loves Mary, well, the lexical items have some semantic translation. Um, the, noun f the name and the noun phrase just say our meaning is the same as our one child's meaning. So this goes up and similarly for the verb. And so the first place something interesting happens is at the verb phrase. And the verb phrase's semantic attachment says, take this function and apply this argument to it, and my meaning is the result of that. So you take Mary, Mary becomes Y, the return value is lambda x loves x Mary. And so that's returned as the value. And then you do the same thing with John, and you get loves John Mary as then being returned as the meaning of this sentence. So that seems kind of hopeful. Um, now we can work out the, sen the meaning of the two sentences, John loves Mary, oh no, more sentences. John loves Mary, Mary loves John, and Mary jumps, and John jumps. Okay, so we've got a fourth sentence language and everything um, gets worked out correctly. And so this is essentially what Chat80 was doing and the kind of technology we're going to do. However, this case here is very easy. So I've just taken names and represented them as constants, and then they're just combined in the obvious way by a verb phrase that's a function. And so all the trickiness comes in because of the fact that a lot of the time natural languages just aren't that easy. Um, and I want to say a word about that, but before I do, I was beginning, there was this slide. Um, so I showed a little bit of DCG notation there just because it connects up to chat AD. I mean, you can't, to do this, you don't have to use DCG notation. You can just say, you know, I've got a context-free grammar rule just like before. I'm going to put next to it a semantic attachment, which is saying how I'm going to make up, work out the meaning corresponding to the parent in terms of the meaning um, that it corresponds to the children. And just like my little baby um, example, normally the form of these um, semantic attachments for natural language grammars is inherently trivial. We identify one argument as the semantic head, and it takes other children as arguments and that's essentially all they do. So the semantic attachment is normally just function application. And so the, all the trickiness actually comes down in the lexicon of coming up with appropriate semantic representations for different words so that you can combine meanings together by function application. Okay. Um, right, so Mary loves John is really easy, um, but the world gets more complex very rapidly. And so here's just one more example of how the world gets more complex. Um, so a few years ago, we actually worked a little on this system that still seems to me a kind of a cool idea. Um, so in the olden days, in the GRE exam, there used to be an analytic section, which was multiple choice, which had various kinds of questions, one kind of which was logic puzzles. Um, now, they've now gotten rid of that and now have this incomprehensible um, analytic essay that I think no one knows what to do about um, in graduate school admissions. But I think in the, in the LSAT, they still have these logic puzzles. Um, but at any rate, um, commonly computer scientists are the kind of people who, when they were young, did logic puzzles for fun at some point. So most of you have probably seen these kind of logic puzzles. So here we have six sculptures, C, D, E, F, G, H, are to be exhibited in rooms one, two, and three of an art gallery. Sculptures C and E may not be exhibited in the same room, dot, dot, dot. And then 
for each scenario, there were a sequence of questions which in the GRE started with the easiest one and got a bit harder. I mean, so why I thought this was a cool problem is that for the GRE, you know, the hard part of this is meant to be solving the logic puzzle. That, you know, the natural language understanding is just a God-given skill that all human beings have, but solving logic puzzles, that is hard. Whereas if you think about this as a computer science problem, um, if you can represent the problem of the logic puzzle, solving it is trivial. Right, so all of these questions are over such small domains that you don't have to do anything smart. You can just use brute force. You can just evaluate every possible assignment and see what's possible. If you paid attention in 221, you might think, well, this, this is like a constraint satisfaction problem. Maybe I could um, use forward changing or out consistency or one of those things. And it's true you could, and you'd you know, come up with the answer in you know, 0 0.001 seconds instead of 0 0.01 seconds. Um, but, um, you know, really that part just isn't hard. The hard thing is, well, how could you possibly take this natural language description and turn it into something that you can actually construct a model from so that you could run your model checker or your uh, consistency algorithm to see whether it holds? And so this is, again, the kind of place in which we get into all of these troubles and translation to logic becomes difficult for all sorts of reasons, actually. But just to mention the one of them again that I already mentioned is this notion of quantifier scope and interpreting quantifier scopes. Now, the people at ETS who build um, GRE questions try really hard to make them unambiguous. You know, that's part of their job because if the questions are perceived by regular people as being ambiguous, then, you know, upset parents sue them and things like that, right? They really, really want to have unambiguous questions. Um, but the fact of the matter is with natural language, you just can't do that um, because there are latent ambiguities. And so this is just illustrated for that example. So um, the first... Um, Sentences, at least one sculpture must be exhibited in each room. Well, there are two quantifiers, at least one sculpture, each room. So there have to be multiple readings, right? Um, and there are, right? So there's one reading in which um, it's, there exists at least one sculpture, and for that sculpture, necessarily, in every single room, that sculpture is exhibited. Now, that one's kind of ruled out because it's just impossible to satisfy in the real world, and so human beings don't pay that one that much attention. But that means that somehow we have to be able to consider these semantic interpretations and work out which readings to exclude and settle on the right reading. Um, if we then go on to the next sentence of no more than three sculptures may be exhibited in any room, it turns out whether we get more than two readings here, because you also um, get extra scope ambiguities when you have elements like may. So may and various other modal operators, that they also introduce scopes. So there are at least three readings that you can get for this sentence. So one reading is, um, for every room, it's the case that there are no more than three sculptures that are exhibited in it. That's the reading that you're meant to get. Um, but you can get other readings as well, and these aren't readings that you can kind of rule out as impossible to satisfy in the world. Another reading is that in total, at most, three sculptures are exhibited. So that's saying in any room whatsoever, um, there can be no more than three sculptures exhibited and all the rest of them have to be, you know, kept in the attic or whatever. Well, you know, that's a possible state of the world. It's not impossible to satisfy. It's not what's intended. Um, a third possible reading for this sentence is to say that there's a, somehow a special set of three or less sculptures, and that special set of sculptures, they can be exhibited in any room whatsoever, um, but for all the other sculptures, there are restrictions on which rooms you're allowed to exhibit them in. Again, that's a possible state of the world which can't be sort of ruled out categorically. So you, um, 
So somehow you have to be able to build and consider these representations and work out how to possibly evaluate them. And so that starts to make the natural language understanding problem look much harder. And in particular, none of those questions about scope were represented whatsoever in our semantic, in our syntactic representation of the sentence. So if we take um, you know, the first sentence, at least one sculpture must be exhibited in each room, and we give it to our parser, the parser is going to give a syntactic representation to that sentence. And as we build, built our PCFGs, um, it'll only build, it'll just return the best one. Now, admittedly, there are other parse representations for that sentence, but the different parse representations aren't meant to be representing different semantic structures, that all of these all of these semantic differences are being represented at a level beyond the syntax. And so the syntax isn't really specifying all the details of the semantics. There's other things yet to figure out. Um, and so in general, it's the case um, that traditional syntactic grammars don't really represent the semantics of a sentence in a straightforward way. That they show the syntactic building blocks of that sentence, but it's just not their job to say, well, what is the scope of a quantifier? What's the scope of negation? Which things uh, modify, which things are predicated of which things over long distances? They're not doing that. And so because of that, taking a syntactic grammar and then coming up with an interpretation in terms of semantics is a kind of a difficult thing. And if you want to do that task, the way you do that difficult thing is you write complex lambda expressions and you write complex combination and inference rules so you can get out semantic meanings even though that they can be quite distant from the syntactic form. And next time, I'm going to talk about how to do that. Um, but briefly, just for the end of this time, I want to mention an alternative which is um, some people think that that's much too much work to do. And so the alternative thing that you could do um, is just change your grammar so that the grammar is trying to directly reflect the semantics. Um, and at that point, you kind of give up on your grammar being a good representation of the syntax because you're effectively mucking with the grammar in terms to make it look more like your semantic representations. And so this is known as semantic grammars. Um, now, semantic grammar is a dumb name, I've always thought, because, I mean, a semantic grammar is just a grammar like any other grammar. You're writing a context-free grammar. Um, but the semantic part is all in the, the person who wrote the grammar's head, that they're saying, I'm going to try and write the grammar to get, make it easy to get out the kind of meanings that I'm interested in. And so where these grammars have been very widely used is where you want to do some limited kinds of semantic processing normally in restricted domains so that they can be used in things like spoken dialogue systems. And maybe I'll just go straight on and show the example. So here's a um, famous old example of that from 1978, um, the LIFA system, which was another system for natural language understanding. And its goal was to be able to answer questions about US Navy ships. So you can figure out who was funding this one. Um, but in the general space that this was in, and I guess um, also the space um, that um, Chat80 was in, Again, an interesting thing in the way the world has gone. In these days, I mean, in those days, doing natural language interfaces to databases was seen as a hot area and a place that um, natural language could be used, where clearly that's just not something that's taken off at all. In practice, um, GUI environments came along and everyone uses query builders and Microsoft Access or something like that. And Basically, no one uses natural language front ends to databases. Um, so, but anyway, just, this is just my example. Um, so here's the idea of the semantic grammar. So at the end of the day, we're going to be wanting to, uh, we have a task of, we're going to be uh, answering questions like, what is the length of Kitty Hawk class ships? Um, and we could write a regular grammar that could parse sentences of these kinds, and that's what Chat80 did. 
But another way of doing things is to sort of more directly look at the kinds of questions you want to answer and just write a grammar around those. So here, um, the grammar says a sentence is rewritten as present the something of ship. Right? So present is you can say what is, can you tell me, or just tell me. So I'm making no attempt to really understand, you know, give a good syntactic structure to sentences. I'm just saying, well, there are various kind of ways you can ask questions about things. What is, can you tell me, tell me, I'll just write them down. Attributes, they're things like length, beam, class, ship is the ship name, um, here are some ship names, etc. And so I have this kind of grammar that's specific to answering a restricted space of questions um, about this application. So most of my categories aren't things like noun phrase anymore. Most of my categories are things like class name or attribute or this present thing. Um, and so words are recognized largely by their context. So it's not really saying that they're nouns, but they're a kind of shift. So you have this strongly directed recognition of semantic categories. Um, but you don't have any kind of general reusable grammar. And so these systems are still commonly used. I mean, if you kind of want to just sort of do a restricted domain recognition task, writing these kind of semantic grammars for a restricted range of English is just kind of the easiest way to do it. Um, but it kind of comes at a high cost since you have this sort of very specific, unreusable thing that's very directed to a particular application. Okay, so I'll stop there and then um, next time come back to um, the general problem of how you can kind of translate syntax into semantic forms.